Hello, and welcome to People of the Pod, brought to you by American Jewish Committee. Each week, we take you beyond the headlines to help you understand what they all mean for America, Israel, and the Jewish people. I'm your host, Manya Brashear Pashman. The Techno Music Festival near Israel's border with Gaza was billed as the essence of unity and love in a breathtaking location. At least 260 people were brutally killed by Hamas terrorists there on Saturday morning, October 7th. 28-year-old Mai Gutman was supposed to be there and had already joined the WhatsApp groups of friends and fellow concertgoers to keep in touch, but she did not go. Mai, a member of AJC's Campus Global Board and a reservist who was just recently called up, joins us from her IDF base to talk about waking up in Jerusalem the morning of October 7th and the four days since. Mai, welcome. Where are you now? So I live in Herzliya, currently located in a place that I can't exactly disclose, but I am in the north of Israel. Are you able to share what you're seeing and hearing all around you? Currently where I am, I mean, we can hear the news. (laughs) We can hear what's going on around us in the south as well even though we are stationed in the north. Today was a pretty hectic day in terms of developments on the northern border. We had a day pretty much full of running to the bomb shelters and staying there, which indicated some sort of an escalation. I can't go into too many details, obviously, but we can feel the escalation coming and um, we're prepared for it. So you were born in Israel, but grew up mostly in Melbourne, Australia. How did you end up back in Israel? I moved to Australia with my parents when I was only 18 months old and I had grown up in Australia, Um, but I had always felt a very strong connection to Israel, uh, something that really I couldn't put into words, I couldn't explain, it was just an inherent feeling. And when I was 18, I just decided that um, I'm going to go to Israel, I'm going to make Aliyah and I'm going to draft into the the army just because I think, you know, for me it was important if I'm going to live there, then I definitely need to carry the burden and be a part of society in that way and contribute because I find it difficult to comprehend living here and not being a part of that very fundamental part of people's lives. It's a very crucial part of people's lives around here and I feel like I wouldn't really be able to fit in and understand, you know, Israeli society and also the Israeli mentality without having that experience. Um, And I also just think that it's important all in all, just to contribute. And that's, I guess, how I got into the army. And I served for almost three years in a combat unit in search and rescue. For me at the time, when I first drafted, it was really the first years of women going into combat units. So it was a very kind of still a new idea. And I was really eager to jump on that and see how I go. So with no immediate family there, does that qualify you as a lone soldier? Yes, absolutely. So I enlisted with Garin Sabah, which is a program that brings young adults from all around the world who want to make Aliyah and specifically to draft into the IDF, but don't have any immediate family with them. So Garin Sabah provides that network of family and support, I guess, to deal with, first of all, all the bureaucracy that comes with moving to another country and drafting into the military. But also, you know, you get put on a kibbutz and you get given a host family, which is really nice. And it's just nice to have that initial support network because it might feel a little bit lonely when we first arrive. But now we're really like one big family and we still keep in touch to this day, even though it was, I think, 10 years ago almost that we were all together on the kibbutz. So where were you when this escalation first began on October 7th? I want to preface this by saying, so I was in Jerusalem on October 7th. I was celebrating the Chag, the Simchat Torah, and the Sabbath with my family, with my cousins. And also I had cousins that actually came from America to join us in Jerusalem. So it was a very big occasion. And that's really, I think, the only reason why I decided (laughs) to come to Jerusalem and spend time with family, because there was a very big music festival happening that weekend. And I was very keen initially to go to that music festival. I had initially planned to go with my friend um, and I joined, you know, the WhatsApp groups to try and find a good crew to go up with, find means of transportation and all that. And then, yeah, literally, you know, I think it was a couple of days later that my aunt had called me and she said, hey, listen, you know, your cousins are coming. 
we're all going to be in Jerusalem at the same time. Let's, let's all do Chag together. We really want you to come and be with us. And I said, well, obviously, I mean, I'd rather be with family on such a unique occasion. I can go to a music festival any other time. So, you know, I just kind of dropped those plans and ended up doing it in Jerusalem. It ended up spending that weekend in Jerusalem, which was, I think, the decision that ended up saving my life. And the morning of October 7th, I had woken up to the sound of sirens, of red alert sirens, which is the sirens that go off when there's a rocket that's approaching an area in Israel, which was quite confusing to me. It was about 8 a.m., And it was quite confusing to me because in order for rocket sirens to be going off in Jerusalem, for me, I had to put quickly two and two in my head and say, well, that means that there's a lot more going on down south. So I, you know, being a Sabbath day, being a Chag day as well, and my family being, you know, orthodox and observant of that day, we didn't have our phones at the ready. We didn't have the news on or anything like that. So I had decided to quickly jump on and see what was going on because obviously it was a lot more serious than what I thought. And I opened my phone and I'm reading the headlines in absolute disbelief, in shock. Terrorists had infiltrated into Israeli territory. They had massacred people on the streets, innocent civilians. They had burned houses. They had gone into bomb shelters and literally just gunned people down. I think the most shocking part, though, was when my phone started pinging with those WhatsApp groups that I was saying earlier that I was part of for the music festival. And the messages started coming through saying, help us, help us, you have no idea. They're here, they're gunning us down, they're shooting at us. I'm bleeding, I'm hurt, can someone call the police, call the army? My friend's dead, I think, someone help me, someone help me. And other people are texting, like, you know, some people went, some people didn't, it's a pretty big WhatsApp group. What's going on? Who do we call? No one at the police station is answering Nobody in the army bases are answering. Why? Because terrorists had already commandeered their bases. They had murdered everyone, almost everyone in those bases in order to get through. And they'd made their way to this music festival of peace and love where people were celebrating. Young people my age, young people my friend's age, my friends as well who were there, who came to have a good time. And you see them in this footage that they're sending through in the early hours of the morning, sending through footage of running of bullets and they're dressed in their costumes, their beautiful faces made with, you know, colorful face paint. And you can see that they were just having a good time and tears streaming and screaming and running and shooting in the background. And it's like a war zone. It was looked like a scene from Armageddon. It looks apocalyptic. And I was just shaking, holding my phone, shaking. What do I do? How do I, I feel helpless? I have nothing that I can do. And in the meanwhile, there are sirens going off in the background, rocket attacks on Jerusalem, rocket attacks down south. And you just feel like, oh, my God. And you've just woken up, just so you understand, like, you've just woken up. It's so overwhelming. Oh, my. I cannot imagine your struggle in those moments to really distinguish between nightmare or reality. What did you do to try to make sense of things? I turned on the news and... On the news, they're saying, oh, we think that, you know, there are rocket sirens and we think that there might be something going on in the south that maybe terrorists have entered. We're not sure. And nothing about the music festival. The music festival, I think, was only broadcasted, the news about the music festival, in the late afternoon it started being broadcasted. And I, from the morning, I've already known about this, that people are literally bleeding out. People are dying as we speak while we're hiding in bomb shelters. People are dying. And what do you do? What do you do? What do you do in that situation? You feel completely hopeless. And that is, I think, until now, the feeling that most Israeli civilians, if not all, are feeling. We are feeling helpless, almost betrayed by a colossal failure on the part of the Israeli military, on the part of the Israeli intelligence, that how could this happen with our, you know, we brag, we say, you know, we've got the strongest military and how, how could this possibly happen with the most deaths, the most Jewish deaths to occur in a single day since the Holocaust? unfathomable. How has your IDF service impacted your connection to Judaism or your connection to Israel? It definitely changed me. It definitely strengthened, I think, my Jewish identity and my Zionist identity. It gave me immense purpose also as the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, especially one of the largest families of Holocaust survivors in Melbourne that really 
I think, established the community in terms of, you know, our schools, our shuls, our youth movements. Our family has a very big part to play and I'm very privileged to be part of that family. But for me, it was, you know, to draft into the army, it's something that I felt of something of an obligation almost because I knew and we can really take this situation as an example, but I knew that if I don't do something, if I'm not part of the solution or the help, I guess, then we may not have a country, which means that we may have a Holocaust again. And we saw the effects today of the very real existential crisis and threat that we face in Israel along our borders And if anything was to happen, if we let our guard down for even a second, this is the result. We don't have an alternative. We don't. We have a purpose. And my purpose, I feel everyone has a purpose, but my purpose that I genuinely feel, this was really strengthened in the army, was when I swore allegiance to the army and to the state, I felt within myself that this is This is something that I won't only interpret in terms of my service and my physical military service, but I'll take with me to my grave. I will do this in any capacity that I can. I work in Hasbara. It's my passion to defend this state because I just know that we have no other alternative without it. The alternative that we have is persecution, as the Jewish nation has faced for many years. And that's not an alternative we can accept. Mai, do you feel like you're at home right now? Absolutely. I feel at home. I've never felt more at home than I have in Israel. When I come to Israel, it's it's an immediate relief, a sense of relief in my heart. It's like something when I live abroad or when I'm abroad, there's a constant sense of yearning that I can never shake. doesn't matter what I try. doesn't matter how many good people are surrounding me and my loving family. As much as I love them so much, it'll never fill that void that I have that's really only filled when I'm in Israel. And I can't explain it. Sounds, I don't know, spiritual, I guess, but that it is what it is. And I feel very comfortable here, despite the chaos that's going on around us. I know that I am where I need to be. But you're not just living in Israel. You're serving your nation. You're now defending it during one of its most dire moments in modern history. I mean, until I got called up, I was sitting on spilkers. I was, (laughs) I couldn't even... Imagine, like, I I was just, what can I do? I went to go to the supermarket and I bought a bunch of, like, a a huge, like, you know, carton worth of stuff for soldiers that were already serving, that were already called up. I went to go help pack boxes. I felt so helpless, though. I really was just waiting for the call. I had been on standby already from Saturday. But standby, obviously, is just when, you know, your bags have to be packed, but you don't know when you're going to be called. And it could be at any time. It could be never at all. So... I am happy to just be part of a very strong nation, a very strong military. Despite what's happened recently, I do still believe that our nation is strong and our military is strong and we will get through this. We will overcome this because, as we can see, I mean, you know, this whole year we've been crying over internal division over the judicial reforms in Israel. And it just goes to show, you know, what tragedy, unfortunately, that it has to come to tragedy to bring us together. But At the end of the day, when it comes to real stuff, when it comes to the existential threats and the things that affect us all, then it shows that we bound together and we are strong together. And everybody, doesn't matter what your religious, political affiliations are, we are all in this together and everybody is banding with us together. And it's so special to see. And it's only in Israel that we can see such a special and unique form of unity. Is there anything else that you want Americans or Australians to know, people who are outside of Israel? Anything that you want them to know about what's happening there? I just want you guys to know, if whoever's listening here, I know that it's very hard. The situation is unlike anything that we've seen before. We've never experienced anything like this, especially not in our recent history. But I want you to know, and I, I know it feels difficult being so far away because I've been there. It's difficult to report on things so far away, but your support and your raising awareness, your husbara, your... Social media engagement, it means a lot. Your thoughts and prayers mean a lot. We feel your prayers. We feel your presence with us. We feel you standing behind us. And it's like a whole other army is standing behind us. It might feel like you're not doing enough or you're not doing anything at all, really. But honestly, it's more than what you think. It's more than what you believe. So just stand by us. 
and don't give up hope because we certainly aren't and we can't. We don't have that luxury of giving up hope. I think our entire nation is built on hope and that's where our resilience comes from. Be strong. We will win this. We will get through this by hook or by hook. We'll make it through as long as we all stick together, as long as we make sure that we count what's important. We remember what's important, who's important to us, hug your loved ones because currently there are so many. There are over 1,300 families around Israel that are currently grieving and mourning and they don't get that opportunity. So make sure to tell your parents you love them, tell your kids you love them, your sisters, your brothers, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, your friends, because not everybody has that luxury. And yeah, we'll do what we can over here. So you do what you can over there. Mai, thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you for your service. And we will certainly be praying for you. Thank you. American Jewish Committee's Israel Emergency Campaign has already raised more than $1.5 million, funds that have already gone to Israeli hospitals, efforts to evacuate the elderly, NGOs such as Israel providing support for children, and friends of the Israel Defense Forces. If you would like to donate, go to ajc.org slash support Israel. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by AJC. Our producer is Atara Lakritz. Our sound engineer is TK Broderick. You can subscribe to People of the Pod on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or learn more at ajc.org slash people of the pod. The views and opinions of our guests don't necessarily reflect the positions of AJC. We'd love to hear your views and opinions or your questions. You can reach us at people of the pod at ajc.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, please be sure to tell your friends, tag us on social media with hashtag people of the pod, and hop on to Apple Podcasts to rate us and write a review to help more listeners find us. Tune in next week for another episode of People of the Pod.